Hi, welcome back to Uncommon Sense from the Sociological Review. I'm Rosie Hancock in Sydney, Australia. And I'm Alexis Hugh Trong in Ottawa, Canada. Each month, we take a theme that seems straightforward, say, like emotions or cities, and talk our way through it, into it, to sit more critically, more sociologically. Yeah, it's about seeing our world through a lens, but without the paywalls or the sometimes complex language that comes with sociology. And we do this because we really do think that seeing and listening to the world like a sociologist, although it's not only one way of doing that, of course, uh, can help us to think differently about that world and also to start changing it. It helps us call out what might look to be done deals or just the way it is kind of situations and say, hang on, maybe not. And this week we're thinking about the idea of natives, of being native. This is a notion that relates really closely to some of the conversations we've already had about things like security, emotion and home. Actually, Alexis, I think it was for that home episode that you and I, living where we do, both mentioned the importance of acknowledging we both work on what often gets called unceded Indigenous land. And that's something we might return to. Alexis, that word native, what does it bring up for you? I'm not sure. Growing up in Quebec and studying in French, the French word natif didn't have any special meaning that I can remember. Just being from somewhere, I guess. Like, what city are you from? I've also heard the word native being translated into French as autochtone, which would itself be closer maybe to autochtony or something to do with being indigenous, basically, in in English. But yeah, I, I feel like all of these words have slightly different meanings and are being used in different ways, in different national or, or cultural contexts. So I'm really looking forward to exploring this today. Yeah, it's interesting. I have kind of feel a little bit maybe uncomfortable about the word native. In Australia, if you were to say native to describe people, I think it kind of has a pejorative association. And would probably say Indigenous or maybe Aboriginal or even First Peoples. Although, interestingly, if you're saying native to refer to plants or other animals, it's totally mainstream, right? Um, Although I guess it's worth saying that even if we've changed the words that we're using in the hope of being, I don't know, not, not problematic, there's still a lot of problems with both how we talk and how we treat Indigenous people in Australia, just to drop that in there. (laughs) But today we're with Nandita Sharma, an activist and sociologist based in Hawaii. And among other things, her latest book, Home Rule, shows how this category of native has been deployed and distorted over the ages, moving from being a label applied to colonised populations to an identity category people now actively choose to distinguish themselves from migrants who in turn get branded as colonisers. And curiously, this is all taking place in the supposedly post-colonial age of the supposedly liberating, desirable, only option nation state. Nandita, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really pleased to be here. As you can probably tell from how I just uh, delivered that opening there, we're aware that you're going to throw a lot of those terms I've just mentioned into question. The idea of the nation state, our post-colonial world, the idea of the migrant as well. And we're talking today about this idea of native or natives, something that you address in your book, Home Rule, where you write about your mother's story in the opening pages. Can you elaborate on what the term native meant to her and in turn to you, to your stories? A yeah, large impetus for my wanting to write this book was trying to understand my mother's life and our life together. You know, it started with the fact that during the course of her life, she inhabited a number of different state categories, starting with the category of native, right? She moved from being a native of the British colony of India to a national of the new nation state of India when she was a teenager. And after we moved to Canada together, she became an immigrant uh, and shortly thereafter a Canadian citizen. So how the same person could occupy these multiple state categories, they themselves remaining that person, but how they're treated in the world becomes very different was fascinating to me. And I really wanted to explore that further. 
today you live and work in Hawaii. So how salient is that we're native there? It's a place that I feel is so subject to various stereotypes that have to do with this idea of the native. But there's also things like the Hawaiian sovereignty movement. Uh, can you tell us about that story? Yeah, thank you for that question, because the dominant idea of Hawaii is a place that you come to experience native Hawaiian culture. And one of the most powerful social movements in Hawaii is the Native Hawaiian Sovereignty Movement. Um, many people kind of traverse, you know, move from calling themselves Native Hawaiian to calling themselves Indigenous to Hawaii. Um, like that, you know, the category of Indigenous has become more and more powerful and popular politically since the 1980s. But the, the you know, the Hawaiian National Sovereignty Movement as it has evolved, has increasingly called non-natives in Hawaii colonizers, right? And mm. particularly settler colonists. So um, and that may be more salient in the academy here in Hawaii, at the University of Hawaii, rather than on the streets in Hawaii. But calling people settler colonists has become a way for Native Hawaiians or Indigenous Hawaiians to lay claim to an exclusive control over uh, political community, who gets to belong to the political community here and who doesn't, um, exclusive claims to territorial sovereignty. Um, and those claims, because the category of Native, like all categories are relational, is laid against the claims of others in Hawaii to also belong, to also have rights, to share in sovereignty. I must say that when I first read your, the intro to your book, uh, I started to consider my own identity, having a father that came from Vietnam, living in Canada, having a mother with a, my grandfather was from France, but knowing that like they at a certain time came to Canada uh, as migrants. But clearly, The word native isn't just a bygone thing, and it's out there, it's doing real work right now. It's also talked about in academia and popular serious nonfiction. We'll put some recommendations in our episode notes. Beyond the example of Hawaii, can you talk us through the common sense way in which nativeness is currently used and discussed, and perhaps um, what you felt was missing when you started to work on this? The common sense way that native is used today is to lay claim to exclusive belonging and exclusive territorial sovereignty. And it only makes sense in the context of anti-immigrant politics, mm -hmm. right? So around the world, so here in Hawaii, for instance, it's not unusual to be driving around and seeing decals or bumper stickers that say things like 100% native or mm. pure Hawaiian. <laughs> And those things, you know, the necessity to put that out there, I think, is speaking to the power of the category of native to emplace people, right? To, to make them the group of people who have an unquestioned right to be mm. somewhere. And the people in the world who don't have a right to be where they are unless they get official permission to do so are people who are categorized as migrants, right? Migrants' right to be somewhere is always mediated through the people who truly belong. So it seems nativeness can is not only kind of taken for granted as a category, but also as an apparently fair basis for laying claim to things like belonging and rights and land. But native is also a word that was used uncritically for a long time in disciplines like sociology and anthropology. Not just the early anthropology with its concern for studying native islanders, but also by researchers critical of those who go native in that phrases sort of in scare quotes there. So those who cross boundaries, who become too close to the people we're studying, that's apparently a, a serious problem. So what do you think's revealed by that concern? Well, I think first and foremost, what's revealed is the imperial history of the disciplines of anthropology and sociology. And secondly, the belief, you know, this is the kind of 
how, you know, housing of anthropology and sociology in something we call the social sciences, right? So this idea that we as anthropologists or sociologists are scientists, you know, rationally studying the other or the deviant in the case of sociology. And going native literally means we've lost our scientific objectivity, right? Uh, And perhaps even our claim to civilization, right? But I think secondly, going native also indicates that there is an us and them, right? That there is a difference here between natives and non-natives. And that's what is resonating in today's politics very much, right? That you know, and that's a racist, that is a racialized way of imagining people, right? That we belong to different types, right? That's literally what is meant when we say, I belong to race X and you belong to race Y. And I think that that category of native is not only an imperial state category of subordination, of colonization, but also a racialized category that, dis- that makes you someone who is not like me. Okay, let's try and build a bit of a timeline here. As I understand it, this category of native that's around today emerged or at least became really entrenched with the rise of empire, yes? Could you tell us more about how that happened? And also, what age of empire you're talking about? Right, so the category of native actually has a class basis. You know, the kind of first use of the category of native was meant to indicate that you were a servant, that you were someone whose labor was controlled by someone else. Uh, It then moved into the imperial realm as um, empires in Europe expanded and started forming colonies. Um, Ireland, for instance, the people who were colonized in Ireland would have been called the natives of Ireland. And that class connotation remained, right, that these natives of Ireland Um, And then, you know, the natives of Barbados, the natives of India were the people who would whose labor would be controlled and the wealth of whose labor would be appropriated by the imperial rulers. And then this kind of strengthening of a racialized component was added where being a native of a colony was not only politically subordinating you, was not only you know, putting your labor under the control of someone else, but also you were a different kind of human being from those who were colonizing you, a inferior kind of being from those who were colonizing you. Okay, so how was this category of native then given new extended life in nation states? One might assume that it would go away with the so-called end of empire in the mid-20th century in a supposedly liberatory, celebratory, quote, post-colonial moment, but it didn't. Yeah, I think that, you know, people who were categorized by imperial states as natives of one or another colony tried to run as far away as they could from that category while they were engaged in independence movements. They... I think in a sense bought into the hierarchy that if you belong to nations, that meant that you were of a higher order of human being than if you were a native or a tribe or a clan. And so I think that people who were categorized as natives tried to reimagine themselves as nations, again, in order to lay claim to independence, to home rule, to self-rule, Nation states announce themselves on the world stage as independent sovereign bodies by enacting immigration controls. So as you see each and every new nation state being formed, you see new laws passed against citizenship and immigration. Who could be a member of the nation? Who had the right to be on the territory of the state? Um, So this category of native Um, became very useful within nation states to distinguish themselves from those who came to be called migrants. Actually, can we expand on that a bit with an example? Perhaps Narendra Modi's India, a country that's been marking 75 years since the end of imperial rule and where Hindu nationalism is now a guiding principle. Yeah, so India has been independent, an independent nation state since 1947, um, passed an you know citizenship and immigration law 
uh, quickly after declaring itself an independent nation state. And since that time has been narrowing the criteria for national belonging. And we're seeing that intensifying um, with the rise of the Hindu nationalist, or, you know, some would argue, and I would not disagree with them, Hindu fascist movements to say that the true nationals of India, the true natives of India, are those who are Hindus, right? That India is a Hindu nation. And if you're not Hindu, then you are a suspect member of the nation, or, and especially if you're Muslim today, or Christian, you are an absolute outsider to the nation. And, you know, one thing that's important to note here is that when we categorize some people as native members of the nation and other peoples as foreign to the nation, we're also, what India is doing under Narendra Modi is replaying the anti-colonial movement, right? You know, this happens across the world, actually. But what Modi is doing is saying not only are Muslims or Christians outsiders to the nation, but they're foreign occupiers. And so they mobilize the same kind of sentiments that were mobilized against the British to say that to be truly liberated, to be truly sovereign over our territory, we need to eliminate this foreign occupier. So I think... Again, this is where the category, like the conflation of people as foreigners and colonizers or occupiers comes into play. In countries like Australia, where I am, Nandita, and indeed in the US where you are, you have reservations, kind of places, these sites that ostensibly preserve and protect Indigenous communities where identity, land and rights map onto each other. I'm wondering how you would talk critically of this particular kind of setup and how it might speak to this complicated idea of autochthony that Alexis mentioned right at the top of the show. So that's this word to do with a kind of truly and original belonging to a particular place, like literally to the soil, yeah? Right. I think that in Australia and in the United States and in the other, you know, former British white settler colonies, the category of native was used to immobilize people, to steal their land, to take away their rights, and to subject their labor to the control of the colonizer, right? So reservations were these kind of contained spaces from which the quote-unquote natives of the colony were not allowed to move out, right? So we can also kind of trace back the history of mobility controls, passport controls to, for example, the past laws that were enacted against the quote-unquote natives of these British white settler colonies. So that's one thing, right? Uh, The second thing is that as colonized people of those places were contained in those, there were also certain kinds of rights that were attached to belonging to um, a native group, right? Um, And each of these states, the Australian state, the Canadian state, the US state, the New Zealand state, you know, put into place, quote unquote, native leaders or native rulers on reservations with a kind of idea, once again, that the natives were in fact ruling themselves on the reservations. And I think They also established criteria for membership in Native political bodies, right? And that was often on a racialized basis, right? So how much, quote unquote, Native blood did you have was often the main criteria for whether you were allowed to live on the reservation, whether you were allowed to have whatever rights uh, to land came from being a member of that political formation. So, Nandita, I am curious, we've spoken about India and then we've just kind of been speaking about Australia and I'm curious about the difference between these contexts because it strikes me that in a place like India the so-called natives are now in power whereas in Australia and the US the experience of colonization could actually still be ongoing for for people and so it feels like there's a different there there are different kind of factors at play in these different contexts and that perhaps that the idea of nativeness or indigeneity might still have salience for people um, 
in contexts where they're still feeling the effects of kind of dispossession and oppression. And I'm just curious what you would say to that. Well, I certainly think that it is true that Indigenous people in Australia or Canada or the United States are facing enormous subjugation and subordination. But laying claims to nativeness in the world today is to lay claim to ideas of nationness. Right. So na- native mm, yeah, native right. used to be a category that didn't allow you to make very many claims at all, other than, for instance, the claim to I get to live on this reservation. Um, but today, claiming, you know, laying claim to nativeness allows you to be heard on an international stage as having national status in a particular place. Um, So I think that that's one historical difference that we need to pay attention to. The other thing, of course, is, you know, we we really do need to unpack nationalism here (laughs) when we're talking about laying claim to national territorial sovereignty. The idea that the natives rule in India is, I think, a nationalist myth. And it's certainly a Hindu fascist myth that the Hindus rule India. I think what, you know, nationalism does is convince people that they are the sovereign, right? It's, you know, this idea of popular sovereignty rather than that they are, in fact, being ruled over. So what I try to do in Home Rule is to show that claims of national independence did not, and the realization of national independence, which many Indigenous nationalist movements today hope for, right, um, that that achieving national independence did not end the relationships of colonialism. And maybe we can pause here and note that history actually didn't have to go this way, right? I mean, we've been talking about how the damaging idea of the native that underpin empire lives in the nation state as the basis for us and them politics and for dangerous ideas to do with belonging and entitlement and, and so on. Ideas explored by Bridget Anderson actually in her book, Us and Them, and them having like a question mark at the end. But some thinkers have actually done this thought experiment. Can you introduce us to any who've pictured alternative paths? Well, I think that the people who envisioned alternative paths aren't the theorists or the historians or the sociologists. It's the people who were fighting colonialism, right? Not all anti-colonial movements were framed as national liberations, right? Wanting to achieve territorial sovereignty, right? Or independence as, you know, uh, new nation states. There were many, many other ways that people fought colonialism. So for instance, in the French empire in Africa, Frederick Cooper, the historian, has documented ways that people fought against their subordination within the French empire, for example, by saying that railroad workers in French colonies in Africa, their anti-colonial demand wasn't for territorial sovereignty, but for wage parity with workers in European France, right? Mm. So they were saying that if I'm a railroad worker within the French empire in Africa, I should have the same wages as the railroad workers in European France, there were even more radical demands than that by saying that there shouldn't be class rule, right? That, you know, not only do we want wage parity, we want an end to the exploitation of our labor, right? We want our lands to be held in common. We don't want to live within state territories. We want to have a common relationship, common property relationship to the land. We want a relationship to one another as Mm -hmm. commoners rather than the subjects of any state. So there were incredibly, I would argue, much more radical demands and hopes and dreams than those achieved by national liberation movements. Mm. And in fact, I would go even further and say that national liberation movements co-opted anti-colonialism in order to put in a new set of rulers who were supposedly, quote unquote, us, And what we've seen is that, of course, that changed very little and, in fact, made things much worse. Yeah, right. I I think what you've just been saying kind of um, 
you've brought up this idea of methodological nationalism, so kind of how sociology and its way of going about research and theorising can inadvertently reproduce the nation, like uh, when people might study migration by accepting the state's own categories, for example. Um, and that's something that's written about by Nina Glick-Schiller and also Gamin de Bambra on methodological whiteness, um, which is all just a really good reminder for us not to fall prey to dominant discourses in our work. And it's also a reminder of how another state is possible, or at least imaginable, I suppose. For now, though, we see how the contemporary nation state really relies upon those old ideas of natives versus non-natives that was so powerful under colonial rule. But as you observe it, it's been flipped around a bit to the extent that migrants now get labelled as colonisers. Is that a fair summary? It sounds like quite a feat of logic. We only have to look at politics around the world. We can do it through a lens of political sociology, for instance, right? Like how do these discourses and state categories uh, shape social relationships? What institutions are imposing these relationships upon us? And what we see across the world and across the political spectrum from left to right is an increasing claim to nativeness against the migrant other, right? We see that, um, for example, what we've been talking about labeling uh, non-natives as settler colonists, but we also see it in far-right movements in Europe, right? We um, So we're talking in September and we've just seen the victory of a, you know, of a far-right coalition of parties in Sweden. Um, one of the main parties of that coalition are the Swedish Democrats. Um, and they have long been arguing that their platform is to return Sweden to its natives and to have a 100% ban on the incorporation of migrants into Swedish society, right? So you know, this is a very, very powerful force. It's not just something that, um, you know, obscure sociologists may be interested in looking at. The category of native has been turned on its head from a category of subordination under empires to a category of exaltation under nation states. And actually, Nandita, uh, you mentioned like the far right, and I'm, I was wondering about how even on the left, you get calls like in the UK, for example, for British jobs, for British workers, uh, and that kind of discourse. Now, critics of that might call it, I guess, fascism, which helps to frame it as extreme or as exceptional. Uh, but I guess what you're saying about the nation state and how it frames ideas, for right? example, entitlement and belonging, also shows that this kind of thinking is pretty much encouraged by our current systems, it's a uh, it's at a systemic level, as well as exceptional. Yeah, that's a really great way of putting it. That um, the nation state encourages us to think of ourselves as nationals, to think that the only people who have a right to life in the places that they live are those who have been identified as members of the nation, and that is narrowing and hardening around the category of the native, right? So that in the UK, for instance, you don't, you know, you don't get to be a member of the nation just because you have UK citizenship. You also have to be part of this imaginary of the ancient people of England, mm. right? Uh, and so it's really hardening around these kind of racialized, mm -hmm. nationalized categories. And it's not exceptional at all. And I think that fascism uh, is... Perhaps you could even argue part of the logics of nationalism, right? The idea that we can distinguish amongst people based on ideas of blood and soil is central to both fascism and central to the existence of the structure of the nation state. Um, we're going to loop back around to some of this when we focus on this important but rather glibly used term, decolonization. But first, a quick note from our producer, Alice. 
Hello, and thanks for listening to Uncommon Sense from the Sociological Review, where every month, Rosie and Alexis here are joined by an expert guest to dig into an everyday concept we might all tend to think is pretty much straightforward, or indeed, common sense. So, so far, that's included talking around things like bodies, emotions, cities, security, care. You'll find details on all of our guests, our reading lists, and every episode from Series 1 so far. And do remember to tap follow in the app you're using to hear this. It really does help us to keep bringing more uncommon sense for everyone. Thanks so much for listening and we'll see you back here soon. Nandita, uncommon sense is all about interrogating everyday assumptions. And I think we've done that a lot so far already today, but This is the part of the show where we really dig into one thing, so a trope, a buzzword, a wildly misunderstood idea, and interrogate it. Try to see it differently. And we need to talk about decolonization. But as you might imagine, that needs a little bit of setting up first. So we talked earlier about the rise of the nation state as empire decline. Many would describe that as the move to maybe a post-colonial era. But you write about post-colonial New World Order, which sounds way more ominous. Uh, And as part of unpacking this, you talk in part about the West African state of Ghana and its post-colonial leader, Kwame Nkrumah. Can you tell us why? Uh, The reason I coined this kind of pithy term, post-colonial New World Order, and its menacing kind of character, was to say that the world of nation-states that was formed shortly after the end of World War II, was not a state in which practices of colonialism ended, right? But it was nonetheless a time when the legitimacy of imperial states was over, right? It was no longer legitimate socially to exalt empires, right? Uh, The idea was now we are in this liberated world where each quote unquote nation gets its own sovereignty and home rule. But I wanted to show that that world of national territorial states actually contributed to the intensification of the kinds of things that people were fighting against when they were fighting against empires, right? The expropriation of people's lands, the exploitation of people's labor, the denigration of people. All of that continued under new nation states. And I bring in Nkrumah there because Nkrumah was, you know, not only a very powerful post-colonial leader of Ghana, right, in the international arena, but also coined the term neo-colonialism to try and make sense of this post-imperial or post-colonial world. And I take umbrage with that term. You know, I don't think that that is a very useful term. I think what neocolonialism popularly means to people is the relationships of colonialism are continuing. That's absolutely Mm -hmm. correct. But they're not continuing through the practices of imperialism. They are continuing through the practices of nationalism, right? And so for someone like Nkrumah, who was the leader of Ghana, and one year after independence, outlaws labor strikes, passes a preventative detention act, um, put into place an incredibly brutal national security service, eliminated any semblance of democracy by stating that only his party could stand for election, while at the same time courting capital to come in to build mega development projects, to expand capitalist social relationships in Ghana, all while deporting people that he claimed were not true Mm -hmm. Ghanaians, to say that all of that was the fault of some foreign other, right? Some kind of international body and not the new leaders of nation states served as an alibi, right? So that term neocolonialism served both as an alibi to not hold these new leaders of nation states accountable for their own actions against the people who live in those nation states, but also served to kind of mystify the power of nation states and of nationalism, 
right? You know, serve to once again say that if we have any problems, they're always about foreigners ruling over us, right? The problems is ne are never the actual structures and institutions that govern our lives. The problem is some foreigner, whether it's, you know, a foreign state, whether it's a foreign body, or whether it's a foreign worker in Ghana, those are our problems. So what I'm hearing is that one of the possible problems with decolonization movement work is that it can make foreignness, for example, a problem. Yes. And the whole like blame foreigners thing can can it ever lead to a to a good place? Like I mean, I guess it's it's kind of rooted in a poisonous logic. Yeah, it's rooted in a logics of separation that makes it impossible actually to bring about the fundamental changes that, you know, people calling for decolonization want. Mm -hmm. Nandita, I, I can imagine well-meaning people on the left get tangled up in this, yes? I mean, you, if you support indigenous people's struggles for self-determination, nationhood, and, and so on, what language are you meant to speak? I, it feels like there's no safe vocabulary left. Yeah, I think that um, the idea that the only way out of colonialism is national territorial sovereignty is gotten us into a big mess, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. we have a long history now of seeing what happens when people achieve that. And it doesn't look or feel like liberation to most people who are, you know, um, being governed by those regimes. Uh, but I do think that there are alternatives, and some of those alternatives um, are being called for by social movements today. For example, no borders movements, right? People who are arguing that all beings have the freedom to move and the freedom to stay. I think that that is an alternative to the nationalist imaginary that the sovereign gets to control who belongs in any political community and more importantly, who doesn't get to belong. Um, another demand that, you know, more and more people are calling for is rather than nations or nationhood, rather than sovereignty, rather than territory, let's have a commons, right? And the relationships of the commons, the kind of property relationships, the social relationships of the commons is fundamentally based on the principle of non-exclusion, Um, that all people, all living beings extending beyond human beings um, share a planet together, right? So from a sociological perspective, it is about redefining the space and scope of society, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, it's going to, you know, I think something that Emmanuel Wallerstein called for many, many years ago is the recognition that the only society we live in today is a world system. So on the subject of how we do go ahead and talk about decolonization properly, how we talk about it without relying on racist or xenophobic binaries or without reinforcing damaging ideas about borders and entitlement, I'm thinking this in terms of the challenge of decolonizing the curriculum, which has been talked about a lot recently. Scholars like Linda Tuiwai Smith, who gave the Sociological Review's annual lecture back in 2019, But also Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang have written about it with great rigor. It's also a term that can be co-opted and become a bit of a shallow buzzword, should we say. What are its pitfalls and how can we ensure that we approach a task like decolonizing the curriculum thoughtfully and properly? Yeah, I mean, I think first of all, we need to have a clear definition of what we mean when we hope for decolonization. Unfortunately for most people, and I would include Tuck and Yang in this grouping, by decolonization, what we still mean is national territorial sovereignty, right? So, you know, Tuck and Yang, when they're arguing against decolonization as a metaphor, right, that it means social justice, for them, decolonization literally means the repatriation of land from quote unquote settlers to indigenous people. And that the idea that indigenous people are the you know, sovereigns of the territory. So 
you know, even though land is kind of brought up in those arguments, I think they're really talking about territory, right? And territory is state control over land. So I think that from the get-go, unless we have an idea of decolonization to mean the end of expropriation, to mean the end of labor exploitation, to mean the end of denigration and social hierarchies of subjectivities, what we always end up with is the same old tried and failed um, attempt to create national entities. So, like, when we talk about decolonizing or, like, decolonizing the curriculum in schools, for example, we also mean national curriculum. Does that make the whole mission a bit of an oxymoron? Like, you write that for true decolonization to proceed, we need to disidentify with being national citizen, right? Right. I think that that's a great point, that how do you decolonize within a national framework? I think that for many people, that is not a contradiction. That is what decolonization means, right? Is literally our own nation state. And, you know, let's not pay any serious attention to all of the amazing work that's been done on the dangers of nationalism, right? And what that means and how that contributes to the entrenchment of class rule in particular and patriarchal rule. But it also doesn't call for a fundamental reorganization of the institutions that govern our lives, right? Mm -hmm. That somehow that, you know, the nation state is okay. It's again, this kind of logics of separation. It's a, it's a refusal to acknowledge how connected we are to one another across the planet, right? It's a refusal to acknowledge that we, that society exists at a planetary level. So we still have the kind of separation between ideas of Western knowledge and indigenous knowledge, right? And these kind of highly essentialized, ahistorical, problematic ways, right? As if people in the quote unquote West are also not experiencing um, very, very harmful practices. And as if there is no kind of class um, hierarchies within many subordinated communities, right? Mm -hmm. So rather than focusing on the basis of subordination, we kind of just focus on, again, groups, right? And we position, we kind of analyze the world as if, you know, we have a hierarchy of groups without analyzing the social structures that create those groups and place them in that hierarchy in the first place. Okay, so... I guess it seems we're back to methodological nationalism. And that was just a very good reminder that we have to constantly keep challenging ourselves and challenging these kind of taken for granted or or not let ourselves take for granted the concepts that we deal with every day. But we're now moving on to our pop culture section. It's time to share our tips for, say, a book or a movie, a piece of art, a social media meme, or whatever speaks to today's theme, which is natives. So there's a lot we could choose from, and we'll throw a few of our favorites into the episode notes, including Kathy Park Hong's Minor Feelings, which is the recommendation from our producer, Alice. But Nandita, what would you want to share with us? I recently saw a beautiful docu-fiction film called Remembering Europe, directed by Manuela Zechner. So Remembering Europe is this beautiful film essay set in the year 2040, when people are remembering this kind of recent past of a time when there were borders against people's mobility. Uh, you know, remembering back to a time when people actually thought that racialized categories honestly represented the people who, who inhabit those categories, right? Um, Harkening back to a time where people didn't have democratic control over decisions on what to do with land and air and water. And, and you know, harkening back to a time when people were separated from one another, particularly people in Africa separated from people in Europe. So I really thought that this was a beautiful thought experiment. You know, oftentimes when radical change or transformation happens, it happens very suddenly. And then we're like, oh, okay, 
Um, and so I really love this film because it allows us to think, you know, it's not that impossible and it's not that far off a world with no borders, no nations, no states, um, no classes. That sounds like such a wonderful piece of work to engage with. It's really interesting. When I was trying to think up my pop culture recommendation, it was very tricky. Like I kept coming up with what are really fantastic works of theatre in particular. And there's this great Indigenous playwright, Nakia Louis, who has some plays. Uh, one is Black as a New White, um, which I loved. And they are like reflections on contemporary Indigenous experience in Australia. But I realised that a lot of this actually doesn't get to the heart of what I think we've been speaking about today in terms of kind of queering our understanding, if you will, of nativeness, but also borders and race and nationalism. And I don't know, that's probably a comment on my consumption of pop culture and what I gravitate towards more than anything else. But I guess could also be that at least what your average person comes across in pop culture really doesn't get to a lot of these concepts. Yeah, we have a lot of work to do. Alexis, what about you? The first thing that my my mind went to was a song from Snotty Nose Res Kids, which is a duo, and they have a song called Bougie Native, which is critical of both capitalist bourgeoisie, referring to what Nandita, you said about class, and also about being a native. But in general, I, I really feel like many of this, their songs explore um, things we've discussed today. Okay, so we've got some recommended listening as well as watching and reading. So thank you so much, Nandita, for coming on. It's been great to hear the, um, <laughs> is it cockerels or roosters yes, in the background yes. as well? Wild roosters. Thank you uh, for having me on your podcast. It's an enormous resource and I'm going to recommend it to everyone I know. That's it for this month. You can catch today's reading list with pieces from the Sociological Review and more by clicking on the podcast page at the Sociological Review website, or take a scroll of our episode notes in the app you're using to listen to this. They're pretty handy and ready to share with your students, friends, whoever. Rosie, talking to Nandita has made me think about debates that are ongoing here in Quebec about the statuses of different people who live here and I, I guess their substantive citizenship. And it's also got me thinking about how even many of the seemingly progressive or relatively liberal points that get raised, for example, around sovereignty, are still speaking from within some of these trappings that Nandita talked about today. I really enjoyed the discussion that we had today about decolonization. And it's really got me more aware of the kinds of discourses and histories I might be immersing myself in when I use words like that. Speaking of language, next month we'll be talking to Les Beck about noise, sound and silence, a fitting theme for what will be the end of this series, actually. If you've enjoyed listening to us, tap follow, give us a rating in whatever app you use to hear this and keep sharing us with everyone because sociology is for everyone. Our executive producer was Alice Block. Our sound engineer was Dave Crackles. See you back here soon. See you. Bye. Bye.